Oh my goodness. Good afternoon. I'll just wait one minute and 28 seconds. For a second, but at least you know we're here. I've actually changed my mind because I think the number is holding stable. So um, let's go with that um, and let's begin then. Um, hello, uh, welcome everyone. And, and thank you for joining us for this year's Knowledge Forum series. Uh, I am Peter Chin. I'm the Associate Dean of Teacher Education here in the Faculty of Education. And I'm excited to share the work of our faculty and friends today as we explore the topic of student-centered approaches to teaching. To begin, to begin let's, let's, let's acknowledge that Queens is on uh, situated on the traditional lands of the Anishinaabe and the Haudenosaunee peoples. Uh, we are grateful to be able to live, uh, learn, and play on these lands. And as a faculty of education, we strive to enact the applicable calls to action of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission uh, report. We also endeavor to establish new relationships and enhance our existing relationships with First Nations community partners to support the development of Indigenous teachers to become educators and role models within their communities. We also continue to infuse indigeneity into all of our teacher education courses. Uh, I'd be happy at some point for those who are interested in, in the actual details of that, I'd be happy to, to, to receive emails from you and I'd be happy to explain how our indigenous teacher education program works in the communities uh, in Ontario. Today's panelists will be sharing their unique perspectives and strategies on meeting the needs of individual students. Dr. Alana Butler is speaking on anti-racist pedagogy and support for BIPOC students. Dr. Jane Piper on collaborative holistic uh, strategies. And finally, alumni, alumni Joyce Tam and her co-author Kelly Leslie will present on their program to facilitate social emotional growth in the classroom. We're also joined by my colleagues, Becca Carnival and Chris Cuthbertson, who will be providing uh, support throughout this event. Please note that today's session is being recorded and there will be an opportunity for questions and answers after all speakers have presented. I encourage you to use, uh, I'll use the Zoom question and action, question and answer functions. Uh, with that said, uh, I'm pleased to introduce our, introduce our first speaker, Alana Butler. Alana is an assistant professor and EDI coordinator in the Faculty of Education here at Queen's University. Her research interests include the academic achievement of low socioeconomic students, race and schooling, equity and inclusion, and multicultural education. Her presentation will focus on strategies for supporting diverse students through anti-racist and anti-oppressive pedagogy. Alana, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, everybody. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Christine Cuthbertson for inviting me and for organizing this very important knowledge forum uh, session for today. So as uh, was indicated by Dr. Chin, I'm speaking to you today about anti-racist pedagogy and praxis for supporting BIPOC students. Um, I can definitely say that since uh, 2020 and the summer, um, our, our, you know, our faculty and in, in also myself, I've been uh, really receiving a lot of requests from educators um, at the elementary level, secondary level, and community colleges around anti-racist pedagogy. Um, our faculty also developed a guide that was well received and that kind of also led to a lot of requests. And I've been very proud to be able to work with the Limestone School District um, on some equity work with some teachers that I've been doing uh, some workshops uh, over the past year. Um, so that's been another uh, wonderful opportunity. So today, um, our brief session, we're going to talk about um, racism, anti-racism and anti-racist pedagogy. Uh, strategies for anti-racist pedagogy and strategies for supporting uh, BIPOC students. Uh, in particular, that was an important one for the Limestone School District in where they would sometimes have one or two students um, and they would also wonder like, how can I support this student without making them stand out or, or, or spotlighting them in some way? This is a quote from Angela Davis. It refers to, you know, in a racist society, it's not enough to be non-racist. We must be um, anti-racist. And um, many of us know what racism is. Uh, you know, we hear about it a lot. 
Um, the official definition is that it's an ideology of superiority. And um, these dimensions can be anything, it can be morality, it can be intelligence, it can be uh, values and things like that. But it's a system of advantage, really, that privileges one group over another. Um, this particular graphic, I think, is one of the things that I use with a lot of the teachers uh, that I work with, uh, in addition to teacher educators. And one of the things that I think is so important is to realize that we're all on a journey. Today, you're going to get you know, a very brief introduction but realize this is a process. You know, it takes a long time to really unpack some of our learning and to learn about anti-racism. Um, I really like this graphic because it kind of looks at the different zones that you might progress through. And I'm hoping because you're all here that you're going to be in the learning zone and growth zone. But in, you know, in the beginning when you're afraid of anti-racist pedagogy, you just deny that racism is a problem you know, avoiding the questions. So you don't even wanna talk about it. And some research that I've been engaged with, um, I had a, a Shirk research study about early childhood educators. And one of the things we found um, was, uh, we studied about their perceptions about race and how they handled racism. We found they were, a lot of them were in the fear zone. They were afraid to talk about race uh, in school because they thought, oh, if I talk about it, then that means that I'm, you know, maybe I'm, I'm gonna be accused of something and I'm not prepared. They were completely in the fear zone in this particular study. Um, learning zone is where I am, where I work with uh, uh, folks, uh, and in addition to our teacher candidates and teachers that I, I work with. Um, a learning zone, you recognize that racism is a problem, and you do seek out questions that make you uncomfortable. That's a really important thing is like, we sometimes will be uncomfortable and you may feel uncomfortable talking about these issues, but it's really important as you move to the growth zone to understand you know, um, how racism can affect uh, your learners in the classroom in addition to your own experiences and to be able to, in the growth zone, as it says there, sit with your discomfort. So that's something that's uh, very important. And these slides hopefully will be available to everyone after, so I don't have time to go through the whole thing. Um, because we have a very short time uh, slot today. So racism, um, it occurs mostly in two forms, overt and covert forms. Overt forms are pretty rare in Canada. I'd say having been born in Toronto, I probably experienced one or two overt forms. Um, that means that you've been called a specific name, there's an expression or violent behavior that's been directed towards you. Covert forms of racism are really in the absence of language and it's very subtle. This is what you're most likely to experience in a classroom and what racialized students most likely experience in school. It's differential treatment. You know, um, data has come out um, from uh, certain school boards about different punishments. So saying that, you know, more students who are uh, Peel Board, for instance, came out with a study that said, you know, uh, indigenous and uh, racialized students were more likely to be suspended than other students like for the same. So those kind of things, differential treatment. Um, denial of equal access, and then something called microaggressions. Um, that term came out in 1995. They're not only racial, there's a book there that I actually read, <laughs> microaggressions in everyday life. So microaggressions exist at the level of race, gender, and sexual orientation. And what they are are slight, you know, slights that you might make to somebody that indicates that they're not welcomed in that environment. They can be based on gender as well. If you, I give the example to my students of, uh, you know, a teacher who uh, you know is teaching a certain subject, like they they've explained, they've done studies on math, for instance, where they'll say there are certain teachers that reinforce uh, this kind of uh, expectation. So if somebody answers, gives them a correct answer, and they're uh, a, a, a you know cisgendered female, the the teacher instructor, oh great, you know you get the give the answer, and then you know somebody who's expected to give the answer, it's like like okay fine, and we we move on. Yes, you got the answer, but not to really go like indicate by your response that you expect less of them. So I think those kinds of things are microaggressions. Here's one from a, a subway, uh, not a TTC, which is a Toronto Public Transit uh, poster that, that was in Toronto, it was posted. And this one is about uh, a common microaggression that you may have where you see somebody who's, uh, you identify as being racialized or you, you perceive that they're an immigrant and the whole go back to where you came from. And the person says, where, North York? So the idea from this, you can see, is there's the assumption that somebody's from somewhere else. 
this tends to be quite a conversation starter when I do introduce this because a lot of people feel like this in it, like some people who use this say it's very innocuous. Other people say, well, I'm the person, like when I do this with my teacher candidates, the racialized ones will say, gee, I get asked this all the time. When did I come arrive in Kingston or where was I born? And there's the assumption that, you know, there's certain people who live in certain places. So um, I, one of my strategies I say is, to avoid this problem is always ask a, a student or anyone if they're from the city where you're in. That way you can't go wrong. So you meet anybody, are you from Kingston? No, then they, they get the chance to say where they're from. So making assumptions, that's part of microaggressions. Um, the effect of racism in school, we see pretty significantly uh, stereotype threat is that if you're aware of a negative ex per performance uh, stereotype, it actually does become a self-fulfilling prophecy. Uh, and that the self-fulfilling prophecy research, that comes out of the educational psychologists, uh, Claude Steele and, and uh, uh, Josh Aronson, uh, for years have done work on, on this, and they've looked at test performance, and they've looked at how uh, you know stereotypes and the awareness of it may actually have a, an impact in your performance. So examples in the classroom, um, excess, excessive monitoring and surveillance of certain students. If you make biased assumptions about a person's intellectual capabilities based on their ethnicity or race or colorblind racism saying like, oh, it doesn't matter if you're blue, yellow, whatever. Um, that's the denying the reality of racial inequalities that a student may be well experiencing um, in your classroom. How do we address anti-racism in school? One of the things that is key, you keep hearing about it, but I think a lot of educators lack the knowledge and they really struggle with this, but it's the curriculum. So you have to address through your curriculum, looking at uh, you know, non-Eurocentric curriculum that really broadens the perspective. Um, it's about introducing different perspectives. Um, understand that there's, there are indigenous ways of knowing that we do not value in our education system. We, we discount these things. And one of the things that's important is to realize it can, it can be reflected in all disciplines. So you can diversify any curriculum. It can be math, science, you know, literature. You just have to look into that. And I think that's one of the things that my work with teachers usually involves this, like sort of how do you find resources? How do you cultivate these things, the resources for diversity? The other thing is dialogue. Um, so curriculum is important. Having an ongoing dialogue about race and racism through um, active work that you do with your students. So some schools have implemented talking circles and things like that. Storytelling about uh, race and equity through books and and in your know, films and for, forming relationships with parents. You know, bringing in elders into the school, indigenous elders to talk about their culture. All those things are really important. So addressing anti-racism, I say, you know, the key thing is the curriculum. Like, what are you teaching? Is what you're teaching reflecting the students who are in your, in your classroom? Um, do they have their identities reflected in the curriculum in what way, in, in a way? And if it's not, then, it, then that, that, that can be very problematic. I'm just looking at the time here. I'm just gonna read out, these are real questions that I received from Limestone uh, District School Board teachers. For the workshop, what we did was we did some questions um, and it was around supporting BIPOC students. So one teacher asked, uh, often I'm aware that I may only have one BIPOC student in my classroom and they may feel kind of like responsible. Uh, aside from private conversations, how do we work with them? And another um, teacher says they, they, they're really struggling. They feel like they're struggling to support their BIPOC students and educating students who have uh, hurtful views and sometimes they kind of feel stuck. What, what advice would you have? So for supporting students, as with all students, you know, building a positive relationship of trust is the first step. Having informal chats about other subjects that they may like, um, not just talking to them about race, talk about other things too. And then once you have built a relationship with those BIPOC students, you can ask them how they think they could bet, like you could best support them. Don't choose or decide for them. Ask the student, you know, once you built that rapport to, to, to what would you prefer? Like, you know, we're going to be talking about uh, a difficult topic next week. How would you like to talk, speak about this? Or would you like to just not like give them that option? 
is a really good way. Um, suggested language, you know, I know it's not easy being the only, and, and this is again, very particular for Limestone School District, um, student in the classroom, let me know if there's anything I can do to make things easier for you. See my little uh, South Park with the, the, to the one token black student. So, so <laughs> some BIPOC students may feel empowered by having a voice while others feel uncomfortable being spotlighted. So you show them that you care and that you're aware of it. So that's one thing I'd like to talk about. I wanna conclude by, this is what I try to impart with my teacher, developing an equity lens. I want you as educators to make equitable choices about everything, your curricula, curriculum, the uh, pedagogical practices assessment. Who are you excluding by your choices? Whose perspective are you operating from? Which other perspectives can I include and how are my challenges, how are my choices challenging or resisting racism and resisting white supremacy? So if you go through that checklist with your assessment, with your curriculum that you pick up, pick up on, your pedagogical practice, like think about it, who am I excluding? Whose perspective am I operating from? So if you see that you're operating from one perspective only, which other perspectives can I include? And, and how are your choices every day challenging racism? Okay, I think, oh, this is good. Okay, I timed this out correctly. I would like to direct you all to our, um, there's a link here to Queen's University. We developed an anti-racism and oppression guide uh, that has been well-received is my understanding um, that there's a lot of resources there and we're working on developing a website. But th these are a list of some resources that you might find uh, helpful and supportive of you as you uh, incorporate anti-racism in your teaching. Uh, any questions, I welcome them. Um, just it's Alana Butler at queensu.ca. I think I, I timed myself out pretty well here. Good. All right. <laughs> Thank you very much again for um, inviting me. And I look forward to your questions at the end. Thank you so much, Alana. That was really fascinating and incredibly well-timed. So <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, yeah, and please save your questions for the end. I'm sure folks will have uh, a lot of questions. Um, okay, so I am going to introduce uh, Dr. Janie Piper, who is an associate professor of mathematics education here at Queen's University. He teaches in the graduate and undergraduate programs, and his research interests explore the intersection of teacher beliefs, content, and pedag pedagogical knowledge and professional learning models. Um, and I'll hand it over to you, Janie. Thank you very much. I'm going to jump right in. I'll share my screen. And really, I'm going to continue from Alana's points. Let's see if I can get this to start. There we go. So I'm going to continue from Alana's points and walk right into the classroom uh, and into classroom practice. Um, and I'm going to talk more about the private way and the interpersonal way that um, we can connect with students as opposed to the public way that often happens in classrooms where you have to talk out loud or students have to talk out loud. Um, just a little bit about myself. I started teaching uh, back in 1990 in uh, inner city schools in Toronto. And then I moved to London and uh, always worked in comprehensive schools. The uh, work that I've done with learning skills and social emotional uh, learning started in 1993 with uh, collaboration strategies and 1997 with the new curriculum and then to 2000 and then 2005 with new curricula again. And then I got to update it again in 2010. So it's been an ongoing kind of process. Uh, I find that without learning skills, um, learning can be quite challenging. And when I think about students that struggle in class or students that don't see themselves in the class then how can how i can help students see themselves in the learning in the classroom and in particular since my subject uh, is mathematics and high school uh, mathematics teaching how do they see themselves in mathematics can be really important for for their uh well just them staying in class this is what learning skills can look like i took the curriculum document out of uh, growing success now took their learning skills off the left hand side and then wrote out four levels of skills for um, each of the particular criteria. This is colored on purpose because I don't 
The curriculum says work for a level three, work for what is a standard. Don't try to work for perfection. So that's why level three is bright, easy to read. Anybody can see this from anywhere in the classroom. Level four is that wow space. And it's a little harder to read. If somebody really wants level four, they're going to go up, have to look at it a little closer. Um, students in my class do this all the time. They stand up and they go over and they, they take a look at them. We talk about these every day. We work with these every day. This is a value system that I hold about being a learner. Um, at one point, actually, some of my colleagues uh, at another high school uh, who also wanted to and, and implemented these uh, this learning skills in their classroom, we decided we needed to have our own rubric on the wall, uh, but it would pertain to the Ontario College of Teachers standards of practice. Um, and so we worked on it a little bit, but that's just an illustration of how we and I feel this is really important. How to keep track of these. This is what started in around 1993, and I was working with uh, uh, student success and, and uh, the uh, learning classroom. It's a page. I put on green paper so that it's called the green sheet. The students pick it up. They use it in classroom, and then they leave it before they leave the classroom. I then take a look at it, but it gives them great opportunity to be able to uh, keep track of what they're doing. I get to talk with them about it. They can um, self-assess according to the learning skills rubric and it goes on the on the chart on the page I get to talk back and forth I have some examples let me show you so that I'm going to use my son's name because that's the first name that pops into my head Here's what learning a uh, learning skills page looks like. <clears throat> very first day, this is a grade 9, 10 essential split class. Um, I, at the very beginning, I asked them to write their name. In this class, I had about 20, 24 students. So I had six groups of four. And at one group of four, there was four young boys who were all uh, 15, 16, 17, 18 years old. They had not succeeded in mathematics for a number of years before they came in. And this is from Jake's page. And I asked him to put their name. He took a pencil and he just put it in his fist and he just scribbled on the page. I asked him uh, if he could rewrite it. He did, but look what he said for goals. I don't make a goal. There's a, a lot of opportunity here for me as I'm working the crowd and just in the classroom while they're working to be able to have short conversations with them and it's just with them that nobody else can hear but there's also places where at the end of the day if they say something then I can write back to them and in this case uh, I said good work in class today uh, write a goal at the top of the page and he evaluated himself for initiative at three we were able to talk about what three meant the next day This is October. Um, Jake got new glasses. Um, he's not the kid who would, uh, he was 16 in, in this grade nine, 10 class. Um, he's not one who would be very verbal. He sure wouldn't talk to me, not the, the math teacher um, uh, about things, but he had new glasses. So I wrote, your glasses look cool. Were they helpful today? It took him two days and he wrote down, yes, they did. Thanks for the compliment. I was like, Ooh, wow. He could, articulate that he received a compliment. I thought that was pretty, pretty nice. Here's November. We were talking about um, uh, circles, which led to um, the geometry of circles, but really that was because of uh, electrical meters. Uh, and he said that they were fun. <laughs> I said, yes, I think so too. And then down here, he called the, uh, when we were working at the 24 hour clock, he thought that was cool. I don't often see too many students say that they think mathematics is fun or cool. And this is from a student who really could never see any value for mathematics. I see two things happening. He's showing up. I see his printing getting better. He's starting to talk to me about how he's feeling about mathematics. And I thought this was this is sort of funny. Uh, there, we got cool electrical meters again. But uh, today I learned how to, and he's writing a whole lot. Today I learned how to get 
the total cost of your electric bill. We were working with the electric bills. It was nice to know how to make sure the government doesn't rip us off. He felt that it was important to be able to understand this so that he could make sure he wasn't paying too much or his dad wasn't paying too much in terms of the electric bills. I thought that was cute. Um, often you don't get to really help students with spelling even, uh, except in where they feel is, well, this is spelling moment. This is math class. We don't do spelling. He wrote cylinder. I corrected it. He then corrected it himself and laughed at himself. And then we tried another one. He completed the course and he passed it. The next September, he showed up in my grade nine applied class that September 12th. His goal is show up, get it done, pass, graduate, get out. And I thought that's a very good goal for someone who took three years and couldn't pass a, a math course. The next semester, he showed up in my grade 10. It was a very small school. So I was the, there was only two of us as math teachers. So he really didn't have much of a choice except seeing me again. And he showed up in grade 10, applied. And this is what he said. I am taking this course because I was in essentials before, but I would like to go to college. I said, excellent. I love to see that he was starting to see himself in school, that there was a purpose and value to being in school and to being in math class. And he was able to articulate it. And when we talked about a learning skill, he said, self-regulation. I, I had asked them, you pick the learning skill you want to talk about. He said, self-regulation, because you have to control yourself. It's just, so I'll stop that. Just as an example of how learning skills can work. I'll share my screen again. So back to the green sheet, just some examples. It gives me an opportunity to talk with them in another way than just verbal. It's not out loud. Nobody else is hearing about it. Nobody else is reading it. It's the only page on their, on their desk. And it goes back and forth between them and me. That's at the secondary level. At the tertiary level, trying to find a way in which I, because the only experience I have is as a white cisgendered male, and trying to help my students in the BED level or my grad students also be able to see themselves in the learning, to be able to bring who they are to the, to the learning as well, for me to be able to uh, respond to even some of the calls to action from the TRC, then I need to have a way, a strategy in which the classroom becomes much more uh, of a problem solving space where they can find something that they really uh, gravitate to and then they can learn it and then they bring it back to the class and collaborate with a whole find something new and go out and come back this is problem-based learning it's not just because you have a problem it's a particular strategy a particular way of working and it hits these big ideas talking about constructing extensive and flexible knowledge problem solving skills self-directed there's learning skills you imagine uh, effective collaborators these are all the behavioral strategies we'd like to be employing ourselves. It looks like this, there's a bunch of steps, but what I want to, you to focus on is the, the way that the first four steps of approaching a problem with a group is to talk and to talk and to talk and to figure things out. You brainstorm and then you discuss, and then you come up with things that, well, I think this makes me think I need to learn about this. You identify it, that's number five. You then go away and the whole group separates and comes back because they all learned the thing that they really wanted. And then it cycles back up here. So it's a big cyclical loop over and over. Uh, PBL cycle could take four or five particular weeks if you meet once a week or maybe two weeks if you meet twice a week. So a bit of a long-term process. I've run this with um, BEd classes and with grad classes, especially in the uh, mixed methods class in, in our graduate program, because if you're going to be mixed methods as a methodologist, you probably are not going to be able to learn and know everything. So you need to have a team and be able to work with people and, and be collaborative. So problem-based learning, a problem of research, and then working in a team fit together really nicely. Some evidence from uh, a study that I've been working on for the last couple of years, 
for pre-service teachers, pre-service teachers become more self-aware of their beliefs. One of the best ways for you to make a change is to understand how you are thinking and how you are believing. We've got improved critical thinking about pedagogical content knowledge, which is you know how to teach, you know what you're teaching, you put them together, and distinct changes and improvements to teacher advocacy, teacher concern, teacher orientation. These are all the ways in which we can think about ourselves in the classroom, and they are influential to how we then behave and make decisions in our classroom practice. I'm going to stop there. Thank you very much. Uh, I did get some funding from Shirk to help out and from the MST group, and I do have a set of references if anybody is interested at a later time. And I'm going to jump way back up here. And oh, I don't have my uh, email address. It's just jamie.piper. Thanks, Jamie. We can put it in the uh, in the chat if anybody wants to, to ask Jamie any complicated questions about all of that information, because that was a lot in a very short time. Thank you so much for that. Um, so I'm going to introduce uh, our next two uh, speakers. So uh, we have two uh, people collaborating on this presentation, Joyce Tam, who is one of our alum, graduated through B.Ed., uh, and she's been working for the Peel District School Board for over 20 years. Uh, and it has always been important for her to teach about kindness and inclusion and to build empathy in her students. Uh, and she's presenting with Kelly Leslie, who is a retired elementary school principal with over 30 years in education, and she's written six children's books uh, in hopes of continuing to impact young lives. So Joyce and Kelly, over to you. Thank you so much, and thanks so much for um, inviting us. Uh, I see Joyce and I are working in tandem, um, but she's driving. All right, so I will share the screen. Okay, so um, Joyce and I to, to kind of springboard off of Jamie and the importance of social emotional learning. Um, we, we are going um, on with that topic with respect to the Ducky, and it, it's a resource that we developed together. And it, it's, it addresses students basically um, at the other end in the elementary division, K to three, but as we will explain as we go through our quick synopsis that um, a lot of the lessons, the exercises in here can be tweaked um, for junior grades and we are piloting in both areas. Okay, so, um, first of all, the, as um, was mentioned, um, I'm a retired principal. I have 35 plus, I don't know, years, never mind, in education. Um, when I retired, um, it was lovely to finally have time to breathe and to address something that always bothered me somewhat when I was in the classroom and then when I was in administration. And basically, that was the representation of um, our students with special needs in print. So, um, to keep my husband happy and keep myself busy in my retirement, um, I thought, well, I'm gonna try and, and write some children's picture books to do just that, to represent um, characters relatable to younger children with special needs with an emphasis on um, highlighting the strengths of these characters with special needs. And um, for two purposes, to begin educating our very young um, about um, differences, positive differences, acceptance, kindness, and inclusion. And again, for our students with special needs to see themselves represented and their strengths in um, picture books. So the Hannah series was born. Hannah is a little caterpillar. Um, Hannah has anxiety. And um, Hannah goes through a process and, and um, is a problem solver and, is, and comes up with a way to, to help herself with strategies for their, her anxiety. Hannah has a little sister who is very feisty and full of spunk. And she has a character in her classroom named Zach and Zach has cerebral palsy. So Hannah's little sis, Tempest, learns a lot about um, advocating for somebody else, but realizing that somebody else has tremendous strengths as well. Kevin struggles 
is a bit about a butterfly who loves, loves, loves to fly, but he has asthma. So um, his, this message that is he reaches out and it learns that it's okay to ask your friends for help. And then we have Riley the Riddler and Riley is going to summer camp and he's thrilled to be in summer camp and but Riley has ADHD. And so what that looks like and how he educates himself about his strengths and his friends is the, the premise of that book. And then there's the Bruno series and Bruno is a beautiful big brown panda with autism. So Believe in Bruno is when Bruno enters school in grade two and meets Kim. And so a nice relationship develops between Kim and Bruno. And then, then in the next Bruno series book, Ready, Set, Stop, um, the relationship between Kim and Bruno has become stronger and they both learn so much in, from each other. So that's the premise behind the picture books. And the reason we, um, I brought those forward is because they are referenced a lot in our uh, Do the Docky resource in terms of referencing characters. So quick history. I had the absolute pleasure of meeting Joyce, gosh, I guess it's nine years ago now, Joyce, when I was the principal um, of the school she was teaching. And I, I, I met her and her amazing teaching partner, Sue, and quickly realized that they were a rare combination. They were fantastic together. And they were the type of teaching team that every single year, they reinvented the wheel with respect to bringing uh, social justice issues into their classrooms and into our entire school. Phenomenal, it was an honor, and obviously our, our friendship has continued. Joyce and I, um, when I retired, same, we both um, have an affinity for, for students with special needs. So we were, you know, wanted to give students with special needs the same opportunities as neurotypical students, i.e. through like the track and field experience. So we created an organization called Believe Beyond Bounds. And basically we, um, partnered with Special Olympics and developed um, a, a play day, track and field day for students with special needs. So we started with, um, in one particular board, and we started um, out with, with students with ASD within a particular family of schools. And um, we had um, a classroom of uh, developmental delayed students in high school create t-shirts for us and we had medals as well and parents were invited and um, it was a, it was an amazing experience for the students and the staff and the parents and and everybody that was involved and then the, and we were able to expand our family of schools and then COVID hit so we were able to implement this for the first two years and here we are in COVID our dream is to expand it for all students of particular boards with special needs and then pairing with um, Special Olympics has helped a lot. So when they, uh, are, the six picture books came about, Joyce is the social media guru and she started sending out social media and um, I started reading to primary classes in different boards, et cetera. Through Joyce and I always talking about uh, these topics, um, we, we, we found that we use the words differences, acceptance, kindness, and inclusion a lot with, in reference to these picture books. So we said, you know what, why don't we develop a social emotional learning resource? Because um, a lot of teachers, um, I work with teacher candidates as well, and, and developing a positive climate, like we're, we're always saying um, in, in teacher's college and administration, you know, build your climate first, build your positive learning climate first. And then we, because unloading the curriculum through that lens is so much more enriching for all of your students in terms of engagement. So we um, developed the docky. Um, so what we're gonna do is just go through, there's four chapters, one letter pertains to each chapter. Um, every chapter, um, has lesson plans, et cetera, and they're directly linked to the achievement chart to help um, 
educators with the assessment piece. And as uh, Jamie was saying, the learning skills are becoming more prominent, so they can be referenced. And the lessons in each chapter are differentiated between K to one and two to three. But as, as I said, they can be taken and altered to um, address older students. And um, the appendices is filled with everything that is in each chapter in terms of making it very user-friendly for teachers to just go to the back, copy what you need and away you go. Joyce, your turn. Right. Oops. Oh, there you go. Is that better? Yeah. Oh, okay. And now I'm not presenting, right? Uh, well, yep. you, one yeah. second. Okay. Good? Yeah. Okay. So we're going to walk you through the chapters. Um, the first chapter is on differences. And uh, it's about identifying differences in each other. Um, but going beyond that and understanding that they're positive differences. That's what makes each person unique. So um, as Kelly had said, we have given you in the books um, activities that tie into the achievement charts. So there's a, a task. In some cases, it might not be split into K1, 2, 3, because uh, it, it's something that all grades could do. Um, and then in some cases, they are. So. Um, We've given you an, uh, a task for knowledge and understanding, something for thinking, something for communication, something for application. So here's an example of what you would find in chapter one under differences. So um, this is the first task that we had put out, and it was just what are the what are what can you see that's the same about these two pictures, and what is different, and then how are those differences positive differences, right? So before we get into how to relate to each other, we thought we would try and simplify it for them. So um, here's an example of a kindergarten class where the teacher had shown them the two pictures that we had provided, where the kids are identifying the things about each one, identifying the positives, and then um, identifying the differences and then what, why those differences are special. Oops, sorry. Uh, here is one from grade three. So uh, in the book, you'll see there's there's ice creams, there's trucks, there's baseball, uh, different types of sports. We tried to find um, different pictures that we thought would be of interest, and then teachers can use whatever is meaningful for their class. So here's an example of two trucks, red truck and a a yellow truck and this grade three student had teased out the differences, um, what was the same, what was different and why those things were, were uh, special. So here's her example, explain how each of these, their positive differences make them special. So she said the red truck is different than the yellow truck because it has more room in the back and that's a positive because you can carry your Christmas tree back there. Um, and then took it a step further where then she's designing her own car, or her own truck, sorry, that is similar to the, the red and yellow one, but then adding something different to it. This same child, so this is just lesson one in chapter one, uh, doing it a few times. And the, when, when I asked them what a, a positive difference meant, this was her answer after just doing like chapter one, lesson one. So a positive difference is when a person or anything that is different, and it is a good thing about them. Some people wear different types of clothes, like in India, people wear saris. This is good because they get to show other people their tradition. So she's got it, and that's just after the first lesson. Um, and then Kelly was talking about how even though we are targeting K-3, to it can be extended to other grades. So we had a grade 5 teacher also do it with her class. And she said that um, the discussion was rich. The, it was a good discussion, it lasted about half an hour, and it was a good intro to them doing a, um, 
they're doing a study on the book, this book is anti-racist. And it was a good way, it, it was a good lead in for them. So um, even though it's K to three, it is applicable to all grades. This would be um, the second lesson in there. So this is just an example. I won't go through the lesson, but this is an example for you of just, here is uh, K to one. So at the top, it'll say K to one, two to three. And here are all these different acts of kindness. It all, they all relate to this one of Kelly's books, Hannah's Little Sis, and where they have to find the positive differences, um, whether the difference was something uh, positive difference for Zach, sorry, Tempest, Zach, or for both of them. So that was a K1 activity and uh, everything you need for it is in the appendices. Um, and then the two, three was to do a Venn diagram. So, you know, depending on your class, pick the one that works best for you. Okay, so moving on to chapter two is about acceptance. Um, again, um, the, the Minds On Lesson 1, um, we also give resources um, from other uh, picture books, etc. So we, this is just an example of um, maybe a teacher would first want to read Don't Call Me Special uh, by Pat Thomas, because what we want to do with acceptance and introduction of it is acceptance of self. Um, conversations around what um, and questioning them about their strengths and their areas for growth. And what we also want to do through these conversations is create a growth mindset, um, which is, as we know, the, the first step in self acceptance. I accept myself for who I am, I'm proud of my strengths, and I can identify um, my growth. And in our hope there is to help students from a very young age discover that when we struggle or when we have obstacles, that's opportunity. Um, it's not a, I can't do this, therefore I'm done. It's a, hmm, I struggled with this. Um, so what can I learn from it? And what would I do differently next time? And then what we would like to do is um, apply it again, referencing the characters. So looking at Tempest and Zach, um, and Zach would be a perfect example of someone who completely accepts himself, who, who he is, and he's rather proud of it. And he has opportunities within the book to explain to his new best friend, Tempest, um, that Tempest always thinks that he's sad because he can't play in the soccer games. And, and he explains, I'm not sad at all. I stand here because I love soccer and I can really see how the players move about the field and I wanna help coach the team. So, um, we have a couple of worksheets as well, um, or points for dialogue, I guess, coming up. So in the K-1, again, it's a lot of dialoguing, things I'm good at and things I'm still learning. So it's identification and it's conversation. And then moving on to the grade two, three, we are looking more in terms of expanding on that growth mindset. So, um, We've already done the preface of, the, you know, what am I great at? And we're looking here, what am I still learning? And when I am still learning something, and sometimes it's tough, and sometimes I'm going to come up against an obstacle, what can I talk, say to myself that'll help me? And so we're, we're embracing positive self-talk. And then um, with each, we have, this is Hannah as a butterfly. Um, we have this graphic in the book, always in the appendices as well. And in this case, it can be filled out and highlighting the A's, what we're focusing on. And um, I'm still learning to read. What's my positive self-talk? They can record it and two things that they're still learning to do and how would they um, give themselves positive self-talk. And we, we provide a lot of these things, especially in the appendices. You can use, um, you, got, you got caught doing something good with this um, illustration. And what a teacher can do is when they, once you've covered the program, which will take a while, um, say somebody has this, somebody, their teacher says, sees someone accepting another, accepting someone's idea, et cetera. And then you get a, you got caught doing something good and then you can 
you know, post them around your classroom. Then we move on to kindness. So with kindness, we're kind of prefacing this. Um, we, the first few lessons uh, addressing kindness follow a number of activities that address and identify kindness through self-awareness, followed by deconstructing acts of kindness um, in the books. And it basically, it, it, it centers on kindness is a wonderful thing in both in two ways as a giver and as a receiver. So there we try as much as we can also to bring in extracurricular cross curricular connections. So the creativity uh, bent is something an activity that our, our K1 students could do and our two threes. Um, our kindness rocks. So they, they paint the, the rocks with pictures and positive messages and um, Joyce and Sue have done this. Um, take their rocks and align them along a path. So somebody walking the path sees all these beautiful um, rocks related to kindness. Or design a bookmark. Again, illustrating kindness. What does it mean to you? What does it look like? When have you been kind? When has somebody been kind to you? And then you can donate it to your school library and use it as bookmarks for the entire school body to read what kindness means. Then at the two, three level, again, we would preface this and, and um, scaffold it with um, a number of activities that address and identify kindness through, again, self-awareness. And, and, and this is more of a deeper analysis of acts of kindness within the picture books. And, but we're gonna go a little bit further in terms of, let's really um, study the acts of kindness and let's look at the impact. How difficult is it to give an act of kindness and who does it impact? So we went through um, the next two. This is, uh, again, it's all in the appendices for you. So um, Hannah's Little Sis, within Hannah's Little Sis, the book, Tempest opens the door for Zach because Zach uses a walker. And so we have a conversation. How hard is that to do in terms of an act, easy or hard? What is the impact? Who is impacted? One or many people? And is the impact big or little? So we basically reference situations in the book. Again, that's pre-reading um, um, the books. And then what we uh, um, do for culminating activity is we have the students in groups of four and they create companies of kindness. And they are the VPs of their own company of kindness. And their goal is they have to come up with um, a company name, and they have to create an act of kindness that will impact part of their community. And they write a business plan. And what is, once you decide on your company, what is your act of kindness going to be? How will you make it happen? They Then here comes the cross-curricular. When they present it to the board of directors, which is their classroom, um, they must create an advertisement through a poster, pamphlet, slot, video, commercial, et cetera, et cetera and create a logo. So there's, you see there's many entry points of uh, cross-curricular ways to um, assess an activity such as this. You're muted, Joyce. Thanks. All right, so um, the last chapter is on inclusion. So, um, this is a grade uh, one. It would be perfect for grade one, but I'm sure you can extend it for other grades. So it ties in science, math, language arts. It's a STEM challenge, having children build an accessible, an all-inclusive accessible playground for all children to enjoy. Um, so grade one is like what science types of materials, grade three structures, uh, it fits in perfectly. Um, and then the extension, is to have uh, the students then go right to your local mayor um, to advocate advocate for inclusive parks in their neighborhoods. So I'm just gonna show you a couple examples here of, uh, these are grade one. Um, so right here, raised sand table for those in wheelchairs to be able to enjoy, accessible seating, uh, ramps for wheelchairs, 
this was, you can't really see it right, but this is really neat because this student created a PEC symbol board for the nonverbal students, created a fence for safety. Um, so anyway, so this was a great task. Students enjoyed it. A uh, great way to kind of tie it all together and uh, think about all children. So uh, then this is an example of a letter to the mayor. So it says, this is grade one. So dear Mayor Crombie, I think every park should be inclusive. I made a model for a park. I included an elevated sand table, a merry-go-round with a ramp, a fence for safety and a lowered swing and a PEX board for children, for kids who do not speak so they can communicate what they want to play on. And that's, uh, those are the four chapters. Cal? Uh, you got to change the slide for me. This is it. So, um, thank you. We are piloting the, the DACI, and this is the, the list of the school boards that were real, um, that will are piloting it for us. Um, we we're really excited about Baker Lake, the none of it. We we're so excited of, about pairing um, with that district. But, and if anybody watching this is interested in bringing this into your school or piloting it yourself, we would love to hear from you. Joyce will go through the social media bit in just a minute. Um, and we are looking for all kinds of feedback as to um, how it's being transferred in, in classrooms. So the best way to reach us, um, we're on social media uh, at K Leslie Books for the most part. Um, so Twitter, Instagram, we're very new to TikTok. We're not really sure how it works, but we're trying. Um, Facebook, so we created a private Facebook group uh, for teachers who are using it, just request to join if you're using it. Um, it's just a place where Kel and I can support it. Uh, Kel's been doing a lot, a lot of read alouds, so if that's something that um, you would like and you are piloting for us, just reach out to us. Uh, Kelly's email and then her website has um, a bunch of activities that um, aren't necessarily DACI specific, but uh, that cross science, social studies, coding, um, language arts, tons of activities. And then one of the things that she likes to do best is give kids a voice and sort of try to showcase a lot of kids' work so that we'll post it, kids can go then and see that their work is up. And then, um, oh well, all the things that you need will be available on Amazon. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much, Joyce and Kelly. I love the activity at the end with the accessible playground that looked so much fun and had some real life impacts. That's amazing. Um, okay, so we have a little bit of time. We have 10 minutes or so for uh, Q&A. Um, there's a couple questions that have come in uh, and I see Alana has sort of been answering them already. So um, I don't know if you want to kind of talk about that uh, the answer that you gave um, on the chat for everyone who hasn't had a chance to look, but someone asked about microaggressions in the classroom and asked for Lana's thoughts about curricular violence in ways that classroom activities, curricular content, et cetera, can also perpetuate racial harm in the classroom. So Lana, do you wanna to talk to that? Oh, um, just very briefly, just in the interest of time, I answered Yasmin uh, is an anti-racist educator herself, so I think she's also someone I look up to a lot, but I gave her a reference for um, a, a particular scholar who's done work about pictures and, and textbook photos and how they can serve as what is called visual, are called visual microaggressions. Um, his name is Dr. Daniel Solozano, and I've attended his presentations at AERA which is um, the American Educational Research Association. So he's actually done specific work on like how, how the curriculum kind of serves in that way. So that's maybe one way to follow up. And yes, me now follow up with you in person. <laughs> okay. Uh, and there's another, I think it's a statement, but there's a question in there kind of implicit a bit is uh, my son goes to school in Kingston. He identifies as black. In first grade, when learning to read, he took home a different little book every week as part of the school curriculum. 
That year, he did not read a single book with a racialized character. I felt so sad this was his experience of learning to read and wondered how it was impacting him. Yeah, that one is really sad. And that's why, like, in the Limestone School District, that's why they have been reaching out to find out how to support BIPOC students, because often they will have only one or two in their classes. And so, you know, it's, it's important to consider the curriculum and how, like, for this child, you know, he would experience it as a, as a microaggression that he, he's basically excluded. So it is really sad. And what you can do, though, as a, a parent or guardian is to support that by finding multicultural books, finding books about with black characters for him. So I, I would highly urge you to do that. We speak, we work with, I've had actually some, re, some parents reach out who have adopted children and they, they talk about that too. Like the books are really important. So I'm sure you've already done that, but it's a good idea to do that, to support on your own, unfortunately, because the school isn't doing it, but raise it with a principal and uh, let them know. And so the, hopefully they'll make some changes. And the next one is for Joyce and Kelly, uh, that people are interested in uh, accessing the book, but wondering if it's available not through Amazon, say through you directly, can they contact you directly? Sure, reach out to us. Um, we could give you the email again. You could just reach out to Kelly or reach out to us on, um, on Instagram. Sure, we can figure something out. Yeah, fantastic. All right, does anybody have any more questions before we wrap up? I'm sure a lot of you are still in your offices and at your schools and ready to, <laughs> to get home and have your evening. Um, so if there are no more questions, I'll just say thank you again to uh, Dr. Butler and Dr. Piper and Joyce and Kelly for sharing your experiences and your research with us. Uh, it was great, to, it's always great to see that intersection between research and, and practice. So thank you for, for joining together today. And uh, we'll, uh, we'll see you next year. We'll do this again, hopefully in person next round. <laughs> Good evening.